All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left of Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal and we're welcoming you to the season finale of Left to Black, where we are joined by an old friend and comrade, Professor Mark Lamont Hill, who is professor in the Steve Charles Chair in Media Cities and Solutions at Temple University. Uh, we also know him as the hardest working man, <laughs> hardest working black man <laughs> in the academy. Um, he is the author of six books, including the recent Seen and Unseen, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Social Justice, which was written with Todd Brewster and published by Atria, uh, which is a subsidiary of Simon & Schuster. How are you doing, Mark? I am good, man. I'm, 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 I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm busy. Uh, I can't complain at all. See, the beauty of, of chatting it up with you is like, we, we could talk about the book, but then there's always like 75 other things <laughs> that we could talk about. <laughs> But let's start with this most recent book, uh, Seen and Unseen. Um, talk a little bit about how you got to the point of this book and your relationship with Todd Brewster and, yeah. and why the choice to kind of do a co-authored book at this point in time. That's a, that's a great question, man. I, I, I was trying to figure out what to do with uh, all the events that were happening after the pandemic started. And um, I, had, I was working on a, a very small book called We Still Here. Uh, which came out uh, last year, the year before. And right. I was making sense of all these moments, what it meant to live in these conditions of precarity, what it meant to think about uh, the vulnerability that so many of us experienced uh, because of the pandemic, but how that was intensified by so many other factors. And for the most vulnerable among us, how the pandemic just sort of spotlighted things that we already were wrestling with as a society. And then George Floyd got killed. And it, it was such an interesting moment because, you know, we had Breonna Taylor, we had Ahmaud Arbery, we had all these things happening, but there was something about that moment where George Floyd was killed that was different. And my daughter, who was uh, 16, 16 at the time, uh, wanted to go down to the protest. And I looked and saw all these teenage kids from her school and from other going downtown to protest. And I was like, they, they ain't ever asked me that before. Now, some of that was, you know, pandemic excuse to go outside, but some of it was this moment felt different. No peace! No justice! No peace! No the only thing that was close to it was the Mike Brown moment in 2014. And if you would have asked me in 2014 what the defining moment of our uh, kind of activist generation was, what the defining moment of our racial reckoning, as they called it, would be, it would have been Mike Brown, it would have been Ferguson Summer, it would have been all of those things. But it felt like the international, the national and international response when George Floyd was killed in some ways was even greater. And I was yeah. trying to figure out why, but, I, I, but I'd written nobody, I'd written We Still Here. And so I didn't right. want to necessarily talk about just the kind of structural systemic factors that got us there. I wanted to think through the lens of media a little bit, and I wanted to um, I wanted to ask, like, what was it about the video itself that may have allowed us to have a different conversation about justice and a different conversation about race? What, what did it mean to look at that body for more than nine minutes and, and, and to see him lay there? And there's a way that the way George Floyd was killed with the knee to his neck, it, it was a video Mm -hmm. But it also felt like a still because the, the knee is in his neck for a very, very long time. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I watched my white colleagues and I watched commentators, even the the um, the right wing extremists. Be like, all right. Even Can even Candace Owens. They were all like, Yo, all right, that, <laughs> at least that part was wrong. Like, it was, it was there's some kind of undeniability around it that I, that I thought was significant. And I thought about what it meant for that brave person that, you know, to to, to videotape it for that amount of time. And, and from there, I started to have these conversations with my, my good friend, Todd Brewster, who's a historian and somebody uh, who, who I know really well. Uh, and we started to think about and talk about what this meant, not just at this juncture in history, which is sort of the way I think about things in, intuitively, mm -hmm. but also to think about how this has existed over time and, and to think about the various ways that Black people have used media and technology uh, in this era, social media, uh, to help fight for racial justice, to put a spotlight on, on suffering, to expose the contradictions of the state 
and the violence of the state, uh, but also to get us just a little bit of relief and a little bit of hope. And so uh, the, the book became our way of doing that. You know, you mentioned George Floyd as being this particular moment, but then to go back to the Mike Brown moment. And the thing that I can recall about the Mike Brown moment is that, you know, folks were hopeful, but there was a real sense that if any movement was going to occur, it was going to be a long game. Yeah. It, it, you know, it was, you know, there were no, there were small victories, but there weren't any big victories, right? And, and for all the ways that Black Lives Matter pushed on the walls, there was pushback, right? The way people absolutely rejected you know, the idea of uh, <laughs> defunding the police, yes. you know, within that context. George Floyd comes, right? And you mentioned the, the, the centrality of the video, right? It, and it almost felt like one of those civil rights photos that yes. we still go back to 60 years ago to talk about what the violence, anti-Black violence looked at at that moment. And it was like people began to mobilize and push the walls and, and then the walls just fell. Yes. And, and I remember thinking to myself around this moment, this doesn't feel right, mm. right? Movement, right? As we understood this in the context of every Black movement in this country, you know, for 300 years, companies just don't wake up the next day and decide, right, we're going to flip the script. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> hiring DEI. It felt like a false victory. Absolutely. And, 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 and of course, three years later now, we know, in fact, not only was it a false victory, it was a way to mobilize folks against us. That's that that's exactly right. And 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 you're right. The, 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 the type of growth and incremental change that we want to see is a slow burn from even if you did just think about Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. right, which we thought was the biggest thing that could happen to George Floyd. I'm sorry, to, to Mike Brown, to George Floyd. Now, just to be clear, there's lots of other uh, right, folks in there, right. Killings, lots of black women and girls who were killed, lots of trans uh, women in particular who were killed that never get the right. the, the spectacle of the, the kind of spectacle of, of media and social media behind them. They never get the, the grassroots organizing behind them at the same level. So I don't want to deny those those moments of those people. But in terms of the public conversation, those three kind of moments were huge. Um, and the difference with the George Floyd moment was, I think, the undeniability of the video uh made people say all right we got to do something and like you said the corporate piece of it they invested lots of money in dei they invested lots of money i can't tell you how many how many creatives i know who got uh development deals <laughs> now, now whether those projects were ever actually aired whether those books were ever actually published you know becomes a different question a lot of those dei initiatives and those community investment projects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of them the moment we stopped looking a year or two later now in 2023 they're gone so there's a way that all of it was smoke and mirrors, but you raise another important point, which is that our our reaction to it, our organizing efforts, stoked a fire on the right that hasn't gone out. And so, you know, at the same time that this is happening, the 1619 project is emerging, and you got the right wing that's saying, well, okay, well, if you got 1619, we got 1776 backed by the president, right? Not, not the, the president. So, <laughs> I, it, 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 you, you can't make this stuff up, right? You, you have Moms for Liberty. You have these organizing groups that are saying, okay, we're we're going to fight 1619. We're going to fight for 2022 and 2024. We're going to mobilize on the ground to win these elections by saying they're taking the country back. The word woke moves from some uh, a, a, a piece of black slang that comes out of Erica Badu, uh, you know what I mean, in terms of <laughs> like a damn near racial epithet. Right. You know? and, 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 so, and so the woke agenda becomes the new boogeyman. Right. And, this, and, and and critical race theory becomes the new um, sort of academic uh, a theory or framework that is seen as 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 a, as a as a as a sign of doom and gloom. I mean, I remember when Obama was running for office, and it was liberation theology. They right. were scared of liberation theology. Now they're scared of critical race theory stuff. They ain't read. They don't understand. They don't know about. But they they demonize it, and they know that they can get people on the ground to take over school boards, to take over curriculums to to get people kicked out of office they can do all of this stuff uh as a reaction and so the little bit of victories we got by defunding some police forces uh in places like minnesota and states like new jersey uh you know very small victories in many ways were trumped by this bigger thing but that doesn't mean that the victories weren't valuable because they were right, and right. We fight toward abolition we're going to win but we don't want to overstate the victory 
uh, or underestimate what our open enemies did uh, quite successfully. I mean, I'm sitting here looking in North Carolina where, you know, the folks down the road here from Duke were having discussions about what an anti-racist curriculum could look like three mm -hmm. years ago to now having to defend tenure for all faculty, <laughs> right? And, and the public system in the University of North Carolina, right? And it's like, it, it's, you know, and, and I feel even older than you. <laughs> I, I feel old because I feel felt this was going to happen even as that moment in 2020 it it just felt wrong yeah <laughs> from, from everything i knew about the folks who would struggle behind, you know even here at duke where i'm hearing folks talking about we're going to do this this and that it's like well you, we asked you for that three years ago <laughs> right. <laughs> what's, right what's different about this moment now than other moments but let me ask you a related question Right. We, we live in a world of ideas. Right. And and I'll get to the media piece with you in a moment. But we write books for a living um, and, and we write books that don't always get read. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson we learn as academics is someone will find that book somewhere down the road. Right. So the book never disappears. Right. right? You know, the book will still matter. Um, but can we still do the work that we want to do as progressive intellectuals solely in the world of books? Given the reality of what mainstream publishing looks like now, um, the folks who get put on, the, the folks who get celebrated, um, what has been an ongoing thing in, in Black literature, I would argue for 100 years, where the memoir and autobiography trumps everything. <laughs> right. Right. You know, can we still really double down on the value of putting our ideas in books, right, to have real movement at this moment? Yeah, I think it's a both and situation. I think we absolutely have to keep writing those books for the reason you mentioned that they get discovered, they get found, they end up mattering in ways that we can't even uh, anticipate or foresee. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so I never want to stop doing that. And for me, writing is also a form of inquiry. So for me, I've become a better right. Writer, right. And better scholar and I'm able to do the work in the public sphere more effectively when I'm thinking deeply and, and when I'm writing carefully. Yeah, point. Yeah. So, 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 you know, for, so for me, that's necessary. But I also think that we have to be mindful of where ideas and where black study is happening and how it's happening. And I think the worst thing we could do is to seed uh, the digital sphere in particular to um, to to Kevin Samuels. <laughs> so you're an unemployed mother of three with three baby daddies. And you talking about you can't find a man. Yes. The late Kevin Samuels. The late but, Kevin right. Samuels. But still, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but but I mean, it's the late Kevin Samuels, but when I go to the barbershop, that's what's still playing. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and and so it's, it, I mean, literally, I had to start, I had to start getting an appointment at my house because I couldn't sit in the barbershop anymore because it was literally Kevin Samuels and the conversation circulating around what he was saying was actually far worse than what Kevin Samuels ever said. Right. But, it, but, it, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole now space it, on the internet where where that conversation is happening there's a whole other space i remember where the yeah. Kyrie irving conversation was happening and the kanye conversation was happening and i was looking at the kind of the kind of sphere we had around those issues right around race around religion around identity around anti-semitism those are happening here then i'm looking over here and i'm looking at how people are narrating history and i'm and then i, I look at really interesting programming that i like like sun Editor tv which is sort of kind of african-centered uh, kind of space of all kinds of, of of discourse and conversation. I don't agree with all of it, but at least there's, but it's a more productive space, and that's what people learn. Right. That's what people are go. So when people go to YouTube, I, I, the most people who engage me on the street at this point in my life, I have a TV show comes on every night. People watch it, but I've gotten more people tapping on the street in the last year from my Candace Owens conversation which is only on youtube when you are saying to someone we have to do this so you can get into school what you are saying to a black person is you're not smart enough to get into the school by yourself no that's not what you're saying at all that is what you're saying no what they're saying is is that there's a pattern of discrimination and and and, and a lack of access Just i've had more people engage me about talking about cheesecake <laughs> cheesecake factory <laughs> with andrew Rye, john Lemon, and uh and, and Gareth Denard. the interview was eight years ago but it made it to TikTok. <laughs> When a young African-American walks in a Cheesecake Factory with a Make America Great Again hat, he shouldn't be verbally accosted. Nah, I'm, I'm, I was wondering why a dude was in a Cheesecake Factory, but <laughs> I, I think for me, you know, oh most, 
most, <laughs> most, most, most black folk who aren't allowed in a restaurant is not because they're wearing a Make America Great Again right. getting hat on. It's because they're black. Yeah. And For me, so, it's like, if left the black can now be in that space, yeah. Not, not, the, not the same algorithm, but, in, right. but the same, in that same universe, then the brother who, who's watching this and trying to understand something about masculinity or something yeah. about race or something, they, they can now go from watching, you know, the manosphere, you know, <laughs> to, to, to tiptoeing into, they, they can stumble into you, right? And, and, and that matters. And so yeah. I don't want to yield that ground. doesn't mean every faculty member should do that. doesn't mean that every scholar should be digital because some of us ain't got the, those skills. Right, right, right. right, right. Not, <laughs> You know right. what I mean? Everything ain't for everybody, you know. But I do think that we that we have to think about new ways of communicating ideas, whether it's social media platforms, whether it's the digital sphere, uh, whatever the thing might be. And and that's always been the case. We've always needed multiple methods. I just think that the 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 inventory of possibilities is wider. You know, for the generation that came before me, and even two generations before then, you know, one of their favorite phrases, right, when they were trying to push activists and other folks to really being engaged, like this idea of, of putting skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, you did that by launching a bookstore, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uncle Bobby's, right? You're repping the t-shirt even as we're talking. <laughs> you talk about, you know, how important it is for us as scholars to recognize where Black study is occurring, right? And, and it's not always going to be on these university campuses where yeah. we think it would happen, right? You know, I, I was joking with Ninth Wonder a couple of weeks ago. Um, he's teaching, as he has been now for a decade, this huge history of hip hop class, um, you know, with like 120 students. And, and I could count the number like on less than two hands of the number of black students that were in an intro to the history of hip hop class. Wow. <laughs> you know, so even as someone who's teaching black studies, right, I don't actually see a lot of black students to do how we think of black studies. Right. So where is black study happening? And, and Uncle Bobby's is one of those spaces. I hear folks talk all the time about showing up on a Friday or on a Saturday to get some work done and just feeling the vibe of the place. Uh, Julius Fleming, you know, dropped a note, you know, our colleague at the University of Maryland a couple of days ago talking about, you know, I finished my dissertation there. I mean, wow. how important for you was, was it to build that institution and to keep it as such an accessible space for a wide range of people, right, to be able to come through? Yeah, man. You know, it was... Um... I mean, in terms of my professional life, I don't think there's anything I'm more proud of. I, I don't know if there's anything that I'm more excited about um, than having built Uncle Bobby's. Most people told me I was crazy to open a bookstore in the 21st century. They said, you know, bookstores are failing, right? As if I don't read the newspaper, you know, as a scholar of literacy and someone who has studied black bookstores for a living for the last uh, two decades, I have thought very deeply about why bookstores are struggling, why some black bookstores don't do as well as they could. First, for me, it, it, it was it was a continuation of a tradition that I had been a part of. You know, I, mm -hmm. I grew up mm -hmm. in Philly, and you know, I had the school education. Then I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, and 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 I was I ain't been the same since. <laughs> and after that moment, I had to figure out the world and I needed to go places to figure it out. And school wasn't it. Public mm -hmm. library wasn't it. Mm -hmm. But Hakeem's bookstore on 52nd Street was, you know, the sidewalk book vendors uh -huh. you know, in the gallery were it. You know, if you lived in New York, it might be 125th, 125th Street. Yep. You, 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 you had these, these opportunities, these spaces, these literacy spaces where you were getting access to different traditions it, it was different books different authors different traditions you could third world press uh at the time and still but th at the time you know was the center Absolutely. of this kind of tradition i mean when you pick up the isis papers uh -huh. you know, that's that's that was third world press right black men obsolete obsolete and dangerous <laughs> yep, yeah yeah exactly. hockey <laughs> matter booty you, you, you it, it was there and, and and so for me it was it was like oh there's a whole new world out there there's also the idea um that i had um what i what i call in my older research the literacies the literacies of authorship the idea that i had the capacity and the skill set to be an author and, and and that it resonated with me i mean i in school you know growing up we didn't have a whole lot of black authors but when we did by that point tony morrison had made it into you know we, we got, got to read the bluest eye 
But and we got to read a little Baldwin, but I mean, these were Nobel Prize, Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> elite one, yeah. authors, right? But when I went to the black bookstore, I got to see folk who 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 didn't go to those fancy right. places and who didn't have the the, the, the outside uh, world um, sort of sort of uh, validating them, and, and so. I was able to really believe that I had something to offer as well. And they were just talking about, these books were talking about stuff that I needed to understand. And then of course there was my uncle Bobby, right? Who, when I went to his house, Ebony, Jet, Black Enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. There was a way that I, again, had access to writing traditions, publishing traditions, Black ideas, Black authors, Black stories that I just didn't know about before. And even it, it even also ties back to the conversation about, um, about George Floyd, because those magazines also were our first social media. I've heard, I mean, I mean, it, Emmett Till, his face on the cover of Jet Magazine was what resonated right. with so many black folk. Right. Right. That was the social media. I've heard you talk about flyers being the social media of the day at one at one right. point. These were the things that transmitted ideas. You knew, you know, shout out to E. Franklin Frazier. I mean, you, you understood the black bourgeoisie's sort of uh, uh, successes, however, you know, the, however you think about that. From Jet Magazine, you find out who got promoted, who got a job, who got married, right? <laughs> right. Everyone in America, all, all of them. You found out. So those, those traditions meant something. And so when I got to a place where I had some resources, I said, I want to build something that will do for somebody else, that next generation, what was done for me. And maybe I can think about it in a way that will even advance our project forward. So that meant to me, building the bookstore, but also thinking, what does it mean to have a serious gender studies section? You know, to, to have, you know, to have children's books, a, a full children's section that has our hair coming out of our head naturally on the cover. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, just, just things that we that we may have wanted to do 50 years ago, but either they weren't the, the books weren't there or some of the ideas weren't there, right? What does it mean to have a, a section that takes seriously trans? Live mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to take what do we to have a section? Uh, I mean, there's no greater joy than when you put together a bookstore if you're a book nerd, than to be able to one pick the sections of the books, right? Of, of the store, like, oh, I can have a I can have an anti colonial section, like, Mark, it's your store, you can have whatever you want. So it's like, it's like, wait, I, so I can have a resistance <laughs> section, okay. and then what goes in those places, what goes in those things is amazing, right? And and to say, I'm going to put five, ten, whatever, twenty thousand books in the store and get to pick the books. That shit was amazing. It was, it, it, it was one of the greatest <laughs> joys of, of life. Um, and to say that this will be, so this will be a place where these ideas exist and live and these authors can live. And, you know, if, if you've been on book tour, you know, sometimes you get a, a place with 500 people, sometimes you get a place with five people. Right. But to say that I don't want my bookstore to only be the place where the, the New York Times bestsellers come, but that somebody can come here, right? right. you know, and, and write an amazing book on Paul Robeson. Right, as Professor Redmond did, right, and be like, "Yo, like, the, the people who showed up loved it, and it was bomb. It was great. The book was amazing, and the conversation was amazing." And so, but we can also, so but we can also have the big authors. But when they come, we're gonna ask you some different questions, right? You know, and then to say, um, this is gonna be a place of political education. You know, we did a Palestine teaching. We do a Bell Hook Symposium. Um, we, we started one. Uh, the first one was past September. You were there. Yeah, right. The Malcolm X before the pandemic, right? Yep. We've had, we're going to have our seventh <laughs> one uh, uh, in a few days from the, from the time of this recording. Uh, you know, and we got people from all over coming um, to, 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 to talk about Malcolm. And, and again, to talk about Malcolm differently. It's, it's a, right. We, right. Do, we do an MLK symposium. So, um, and so being able to have these different kinds of conversations uh, and to create space for these different kinds of conversations, these different kinds of authors, and for people to feel at home when they come there. And it's a decidedly black space from the clothes to the sweet potato pie to the music. I say clothes, I mean the, not the clothes, but the 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 the, the, the um the uh not decorate, you know, the the the, the design of the store. Right, right, um, right. It's, 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 it's unmistakably black. White folk come in, of course, but 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 this is a black space and it's for it's for black joy, it's for black study, it's for black relief from the world. And 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 I couldn't be more proud of it and i think the best part for me is when either a young child comes in or their parent comes in and says hey my child is looking for a book their first book what do you recommend or a teenager comes in and says hey i'm trying to learn about myself what can i get now i get to i mean what better what better joy is it than a a, a, a child coming saying i want to learn about myself what do you recommend you can set them on a path right then yeah. 
Um, and so, man, for, for me, Uncle Bobby's is all, we try to be all those things. And look, we, 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 we do well, we do fine. Like we, we, we sell lots of books. Um, we do fine, but that's never been the goal. Profit isn't the primary goal. Right. If I close that four, five, I put it like this, nobody buys coffee after two o'clock. Right. <laughs> I can close at four and not, and, and save a whole lot of money. Right. <laughs> the reason why we stay open to nighttime is because people write them dissertations, because people right. are going on dates, because people want to keep listening to that Lucas right. Angel mix. I don't right. think the music just coincidence. <laughs> Dudes want to get a couple of, like an hour or two in the bookstore before they actually got to go home. Exactly. Right. So they go to the books. <laughs> exactly. Myself included, you know? So, so, so it's like, all of us are trying to, you know, create this space. And so for me, it was like, it, this space is more than profit. You know, when the pandemic hit, I'll tell you something. Uh, we had to close our doors because of the pandemic. It was just a, it was just being responsible. But we were able to start selling books online. Uh, and we have an online website. And and after George Floyd was killed, we sold more books in the next two each of the each of the next two months. We sold more books in each of those months than we had sold the prior year. Um, and it was almost all white people buying books on right, race. Right, right. Almost everybody was buying racial fragility. Almost everybody was buying um Tana Hasi Coates. Almost everybody was buying Ibram Kendi. Right. Um, and I, I don't know if they read them, uh, <laughs> but, but then white people was buying books by I me. Mean, you play, it, it, it was amazing. You, you, I've never seen anything like it, man. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> Mark, you have been, you know, we talk about folks being a public intellectual and there've been lots of great examples, right? I, I was raised uh, as a scholar, right? On the generation of, of, our friend Michael Dyson, Bell Hooks, Manning Marable, Patricia Williams, that whole generation, Cornell West, that whole generation of folks, right? You're like that generation 2.0. And you have always been visible in mainstream corporate media now for 15 plus years and very different in unique spaces, right? We could, you know, BET consistently, we can talk about those Fox years, and I'm gonna ask you about Fox in a moment, right? <laughs> But even now, you know, folks can catch you on a regular basis, either on the grill. Some of them folks will say, well, his grace is sufficient. You don't need our check. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> when a black woman go, listen. I know. <laughs> go ahead. Gospel deals with the body and the soul. On BET, on Al Jazeera. This, I'm just telling you what the UN said. You can believe the U.N. or not believe the U.N. Well, I'm quoting evidence of the inspectors who very clearly said that weapons uh, of mass destruction, there was no evidence, excuse me, of chemical or biological weapons. And, and, and the thing that's remarkable about, you know, how you function in these spaces, you're really different to, to recognize what the different audiences are, right? There, there's a kind of hard-hitting quality, for instance, about your appearances on Al Jazeera that wouldn't translate, both, both in terms of who you're talking to, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and what the conversation is like, right? That just wouldn't translate to the griot, right? Yeah. But with the griot, it's something that's a little bit more familiar, right? It's that choice, you know. It's it's eight o'clock. Let's invite Mark Lamont Hill into the into the living room <laughs> because he's our people, right? So it's it's that kind of vibe. How has it been for you to be able to sustain that kind of visibility for so long, right? Because you know it's not sustainable, right? We know this all the time. Folks take these high pro profile gigs in these places, Don Lemon, right? And then it's over, right? Yeah. I think about how, you know, the homie Rodney Carmichael and the great work they were doing with, um, you know, the hip hop podcast and NPR and it's like, and the, and the plug gets pulled, right? So that stuff is never sustainable, but you've always managed to land on your feet somewhere. Yes. <laughs> what, what has that been like? <laughs> it's It's been a... Uh the most unexpected of journeys. I, I met you 20 years ago, a little more than 20 years ago, oh my God. And yeah. <laughs> uh, the time be moving, man. <laughs> um, and when I was in grad school, man, I just, I just wanted to write. I just wanted to yeah. write a column. Yeah. My dream was to, have, was to have a regular column in a newspaper <laughs> and to occasionally be able to play some op-eds uh, in like the New York Times and things like that, which I still have never done, right? But, but it's, it's a, that's, on the, that's on the bucket list. But it was like, I want to be able to write good stuff um in public that's all i wanted and so when we met and you were writing for pop matters .com, i was like yo that's my life right there. I, was, I was like wait they all they gotta do is write, I, I write reviews and they send me the album 
right. That, I, they sent that, me the CD. That, that, that was beautiful. Those are some beautiful days, man. <laughs> Those were the days, man. And so I, I was like, this is dope. And then after I finished grad school, they allowed me to have a column. So then I could start <laughs> think in a different way, uh, uh, not just about albums, but about bigger sort of cultural yeah. issues. And, and it, it really kind of grew from there. You know, I, I when the whole lacrosse scandal happened at Duke, uh, that was my first CNN appearance, my first TV appearance. Uh, mm. Outside of, I did some cable access in Brooklyn at a show called uh, Black Men Screaming. Hello, welcome to another edition of Black Men Screaming. I'm Mark Lamont Hill filling in for Maurice Carver. We are shoot at the B-Cat studio in, in downtown Brooklyn in Fort Greene. Yeah. People have been pushing hall monitors since there have been schools. Right. 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 But now we're taking things which were earlier a school-based issue, and now the, the criminal justice system is intervening in that. Is that is that a healthy thing? Will that help us in school violence? That's the other question. I, and so that was kind of my, my, my area, and I, and I didn't think much of it. Again, I, did, I was like, well, you know, I don't, this isn't really my thing. And I was like, all right, being a commentator is kind of cool. Uh, maybe I'll be a commentator. And then it was like, but I don't want to host, man. That hosting shit is for other people, man. Like yeah, that ain't right. really. And then I started to appreciate that when you host, you can actually set the table. You can actually pick the right. guests. You can right. actually, you know, decide what we talk about, not just how we talk about it. Um, and and I got really excited about it and, it, and it. And it grew organically. And so I was sort of learning the lessons of the business as I was doing it. I didn't know what I was doing. I took the job at Fox um because i kept going on every week kicking bill o'reilly's ass in debates i don't want special things from president obama because he's black i want special things from him because i'm because i'm a citizen and because i voted for him okay everybody's but, but, entitled but, to that fine but you and i was like well shit you know y'all 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 pay it like i can't get a job like, you want to work here and i was like y'all pay it and and then they, they sent me a contract it's probably the worst kind con- you know it's one of them one of them uh old school rap contracts you know you know what i mean but i it was the worst deal ever but it, it, I was getting paid. I ain't had no money, and I, I had a routine spot. And um, and those days were so different than the Fox now, um, in in a lot of ways. Uh, but I thought that was just going to be my career that I would just hang there and eventually give me a Henry and Combs type show, and I would debate the Republicans and win. And it was very naive. <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't until much later I realized that I mean they they play to win. Their goal. Yeah. You know, Roger Ailes, before he died, said to me, you know, he, he said, look, our job is to have pretty people argue. That's what we do. Right. Mm-hmm. That is true. Right. That is that is their model. That was, mm-hmm. fine, you know, you know. Um, but they also wanted to make sure that they were a mouthpiece for the Republican Party. And the reason they yeah. fired me at Fox was because, he, I mean, they told me you're winning too many debates. <laughs> like, you're winning too much. Not against O'Reilly, but against everybody else. You know, because Bill O'Reilly has his own style. It's not, it's not. It's not that I wasn't holding my own against O'Reilly, but you know, Bill. For us, it wasn't about the the, the winner or loser. It was about hashing out these issues. You right. Know? Right. And he's so arrogant and, and and confident in himself that you know he did, even if he lost, he didn't lose, so he didn't care. But right, 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 right. Like, <laughs> like yo, like this is pro wrestling, and you know, I, I you know, you're supposed to come down here on Saturday morning and get mopped and get you know and, 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 and you know and, and, and get and get pinned in, in in thirty seconds here, man. You're El Conquistador, right? <laughs> you know, and 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 instead you're fighting back and winning, and this doesn't work for us, right? And so ultimately uh, that didn't work. And it's at that point that I realized that the key to longevity in the business, the key to always having a job or always having the next thing it, it is, is leaving money on the table and prioritizing your flexibility. Ability. Yeah. And that's, yeah. What, Nick, that's what Nick Cannon uh, taught me. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's a joke in there. That I'm too lazy to make it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what Nick said to me, you know, he said, leave money on the table, but always have the option of do, doing multiple things. So I, when I was at Huff Post, you know, I, I also was able to do BET and CNN, you know, and Black Enterprise. And, and, and so when Black Enterprise left, I still had BET and CNN. And then when CNN right. eventually ended, I, that was the only time where I didn't have any media jobs. Like, no, I, I still had BET. And then I moved over to Black News Channel. But I, was, I always had one or two things as an anchor. Um, but I was always unafraid to create my own thing too, like you know the podcast, like coffee right. and books, and things. Right. I wasn't afraid to do that, which was also helpful. Um, but it's but it's been a journey. I, I've come to uh, assume that if I am on a platform long enough, they're going to fire me. Yeah, right. I, I, I just assume that. I just assume if I, if I, if I work there, they're, they're they're going to fire me, and and that's okay because if I'm working somewhere long enough, doing the political work that I do. Mm-hmm. 
if, if they ain't, if, if, if I'm doing it right, they shouldn't be comfortable with me. Now, BET is different because BET is family. And, you know, I don't do what I do. There's an anchor, you know, I anchor. I'm, I'm sort of the dead Negro correspondent. At the time. You, know, you know, I do every black person you know, for the last 10 years. And, and, but it's a blessing in a way. As, as sad as I'm about the deaths, it's a blessing to know that black people trust me to help right. that right. person home when Aretha passes or when Michael Jackson passes to be there when Kobe Bryant passed, which was probably the toughest one for me personally, you know, to be able to to anchor their funerals and talk about who they are and help Black people who are sitting at home um, kind of watch that person go on to glory. That, that, that's a beautiful thing. So I don't, so BET is not a controversial job for me, but the other ones that are very different. Um, I, I have a, I have different, I mean, you know me, so you know, I, I got different personalities, different sides, different, you know, different things. Um, and so when I'm, when I, when, if I can talk trash on, on the grill or black news channel, that's, fun. that's me. That's who I, that's legitimately <laughs> who I am. I talk shit and I laugh and I'm silly and ridiculous. But when I'm at Al Jazeera and I'm pressing, a, a, doing a, an accountability interview with, with, uh, with the president of, of a country, mm -hmm. uh, that's also me, you know, mm -hmm. but, and I want to exercise that muscle and I love doing serious, hardcore international journalism, but black people are dying every day. And I couldn't. I couldn't ignore those stories right. to just focus on uh, the TPLF in Eritrea or or in Ethiopia or, or or to focus on you know racism in 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 Holland. I mean, those are things that I care about. Right. Um, and so for me, it's either I choose one of these lanes, or I say, you know what, I'm just trying to do all of it. Yeah. Um, as I get older, doing all of it is 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 more exhausting and less uh, <laughs> less doable. Um. But but I at least know that even if I scale down, I still want to be scaled down proportionately. I still want to do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And and I realize now that that's also how I stay connected with a lot of these communities. Yeah. You know, and, and 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 you know, when when young kids listen to me, it's because they hear me and they see me in these spaces and they value what I have to say. Are we looking at the demise of Fox at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I I think so. Um I think I think so. I think that um, Fox will be rebuilt as something else, mm -hmm. and it may not be within the News Corp entity. In other words, it might be News Nation might be the next big monster. It might be that the the other one that oh um, the other the other one the real extreme right. Uh, right. O in it whatever it is O A in it whatever it is they might be that one. Uh, but Fox right now has several issues right uh, I, I always say fox is to s news what's what the wwf in our day and wwe now it, what is to to sports right is that it's it's not news it's news adjacent it's a performance right right but there are these moments in wrestling where you break character you break kayfabe you know when when the when, you know when two wrestlers who are supposed to be enemies of each other uh end up in, in caught in a car with cocaine like they did in the 80s you know it's like oh, wait <laughs> They can't be, you know, you start to think about it differently, right? When Tucker Carlson is saying, I hate Donald Trump. Right, right. Now the audience is like, oh, wait, this is this, this isn't real. Yeah, right. We're infiltrating capitals and, and, and going to jail for people who actually don't believe in it, right? They don't believe in this. <laughs> they know wrestling ain't real. You know, we, we but we did. And, and, and so I think with that coming off, I think with the biggest talent on the network, um, being vulnerable over the last years and leaving. I mean, you got Megan Kelly was a huge star. Bill O'Reilly, the biggest star. Tucker Carlson now gone. With these names gone, at some point, I know people like to believe that Fox is the system and you, you, they can just keep plugging new people in. And to some degree, to some extent, that's true. They'll, they'll always have a couple million people watching. But the type of power and influence over politics will fade. And once Rupert Murdoch is completely off the scene, um, right. which is inevitable for everybody, right. um, I, I think Fox will die away and become something else. And then I think another entity will ultimately take it over. So I don't want people to assume that the giant is dead, right. um, but but Fox won't be and can't be what it has been. It's been a hell of a run. How do you feel about Fox? I mean, it's been a hell, I mean, it changed uh, news coverage. I mean, CNN became this other thing because it had to compete yeah. <laughs> with, with yeah. Fox. Even MSNBC became this other thing yes. because it had to compete with Fox. Um, let's go back, you know, you mentioned, you joked about being, you know, kind of like the, the news reporter for morning at BET, the host, you know, for morning for funerals, um, the late, great, uh, uh, Harry Belafonte, 
uh, yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about and, and you know there's a way in which you hear the name and everybody knows how great he was and you know we forget about the music piece right the, the first single to go platinum <laughs> ever i mean just right. little small things like that right yeah. and there was a clip of him performing you know with the muppets in in the 1970s and he's telling these muppet characters you know i never performed this song ever before live on television right which, which gives you some indication of how successful that song was in the 1950s at a period of time when black folks weren't on television right Right. right. <laughs> that he could sell a million copies and not perform it on television is just not absolutely amazing. <laughs> amazing to me. And, 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 um, and that's what people don't get about, about Mr. B was that, you know, Harry Belafonte, I think because of who he's become, people forget that he, in many ways, was America's first celebrity and at that level, right? The first kind of international music celebrity, yeah. over success, whatever, however you want to frame it. You know, he, w there was a moment where there was no bigger star in America than Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte, yep. than Harry Belafonte. And when you're the biggest star in the world, you can make choices. You can double down on that celebrity. You can do things to get another hit. So you can sell two million records. Or you can make the choice to fight for racial justice and freedom. And most people don't make the latter choice. You know, most people don't. It's like, it's like most most people don't go back to making gospel records to the R and B and soul career is over, right? <laughs> most people don't at the peak. I mean, I mean, think about Aretha, right? Like, like most people don't at their, you know, at a moment where they could still make this, do that, right, right. It, it, that's the extraordinary part. When you say I can still do this, but I'm gonna do this anyway because I want to, right. Lafonte made the decision that nothing was more important than helping to organize, fund strategize and work for freedom. His example to me is one of the most underappreciated ones that we've ever seen. Um, he in many ways represents the model that I appreciate. You know, I don't want the singers and the actors to lead our movement. Right. And Harry didn't want to lead the movement, but he was engaged with the leaders of the movement. Right. And, and when they needed money, when they needed support, when they needed advice, when they needed friendship, when they needed networks, when they needed, you know, protection, he was there to provide all of that or to help facilitate those things, right? He used the best tools that he had. He used his power and his platform and his privilege for those purposes. That, to me, is the extraordinary part about Harry Belafonte, because he didn't have to. And in fact, not only did he not have to, but he did it at tremendous cost to himself. And right. it, he made sacrifices that people don't appreciate. And so, you know, now, you know, it's like, oh, he's the giant of civil rights. He's our human rights icon. And that's all true. There's no one more consistent, more, more generous, more humble, more beautiful than Mr. B. But he became that person when he could have been Sammy Davis. I, and there's no disrespect to Sammy Davis. I'm saying he could have just stayed in the lane where I'm just going to continue to be popular and make great music and grow. He could have continued to be, you know, he could have just stayed in his lane. I'm not saying that, I'm not dissing anybody. I'm saying... He could have just stayed in this lane or that lane, but instead he said, I'm going to do the thing right. that will make me enemies. I'm going to do the thing that will make me less popular to white America. I'm going to do the thing that will that will that that's divisive. You know, the, the, the banana boat song ain't divisive, but saying we're going to fight for the Voting Rights Act, that is divisive. Saying we're going to stand in solidarity with South Africa, that is divisive. And he did it anyway because it needed to be done. And, and so um when I heard about his passing, you know, it was much like when my father passed a couple of years ago. It's like my father passed at 91. It's like it's hard to it's such a full and rich life that you, you you're sad, but you're also, you also you give thanks for what you were able to get because so many other giants were taken from us. So, so young, yeah. so young. So so I, I, I'm grateful to him. I'm glad I got to, I got to sit and talk with him uh, right before the pandemic or a little bit before the pandemic. Uh, we, we did an hour interview um and he was he was like he always is he was insightful he was brilliant. He's telling me stories about paul robeson he's he's every time he tells a story he just works in this other extraordinary world historical figure that he was like making turkey burgers with or, 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 or playing stuff you know what i mean just like it'd be like the most random story and you'd be like what and 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 and, and, it, and it's great and and he likes to tease you he likes to you know he, he he was a whole person and and a beautiful one you have a toddler running around, around the house <laughs> these yes, days. Um, you know, what does fatherhood and 
and this is not your first go round, right? What what does fatherhood look like for you now in your forties, um, and kind of firmly established as as Mark Lamont Hill? What does fatherhood look like for you these days? Um, I, it's a young man's sport, man. Because I, I think about it in this context, right? You know, and I always have to translate this to my daughters, right? Who are twenty and twenty four. Um. You know, when they were young, I didn't have no money. <laughs> right. Right. And 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 parenting was just, you know, it was always a hustle, right? And I always had to trade off on being there and being engaged and doing some hustle, right? To bring some more money in the house beyond the paycheck. Right. Yes. And 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 so, you know, now I'm a different kind of father, right? Because I, you know, one, because they're older and I don't have that kind of hustle. And and the grandbaby, right, is going to have a quality of life right. <laughs> that the daughters couldn't have, right, for all right. those reasons. Um, you're still relatively young, right? But, you know, what does fatherhood look like, like in the context of all of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, it, it's different. You're exactly right. So when my, when my, when, when the baby girl was born, and I remember, it's just so crazy. I remember literally holding her as a infant at the University of Pennsylvania. You were there. We were sitting there. Oh yeah, yeah I, mean, I remember. <laughs> right, I mean it's it's crazy. She's finished her freshman year of college, you know, and when you know as that came, yeah, you're right. I was in my twenties. I was figuring life out. Uh, I like you, like you ain't had no money, so it's always that balance of of, of being present and also hustling and trying to put right. things together. And I was my I wasn't established as me, and I was into so her childhood and her growing up was also watching me become me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's becoming her. I'm becoming this me in the public yeah. sphere. So, so it's, it's also figuring a lot of that stuff out, you know. You know, and some of it I was figuring out. What do you do when you're out at the park and somebody wants to come and talk to you, right? And 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 how and how do you balance those things? She, she you know, at some point she hated cameras and pictures. It was like it was like, right. yo, every time I, we out, we got to talk to somebody or stop or somebody, you know. And they don't value or respect the time that we're spending. And so, you know. I had to learn how to create boundaries a, a, around that, but that that's a learning process, right? As, as I got more money figuring out, you know, what do you give your child that will make their life better than you ever had? And how much of it should you not do when you pull back right. and say, ah, you know, this is a thing that it sounds dope, but you know, I want you to work for this a little bit more. I want you to, you know, not struggle, but at least have, you know, right. a, a different, you know, some kind of, um, the, the, what you want to do, is, is is create the, a certain kind of experience for your kids and and it's always a struggle to figure out what the proper balance is yeah. um and over time I mean, you know she's a wonderful child and, and it's been great uh and she's now a wonderful adult and but it, but you know i i now at at almost 45 have some i can't believe you just said that right you're, i know you're almost 45 <laughs> It, it, it's just nuts because it's like I'm at the stage where I'm all, I'm still relatively young, but also like I'm not 22 year old that was trying to write pop matters article, right? And I got gray hair, and you know and I'm I'm figuring it out. And so now I have perspective uh, as as a, as, a, as a father again. I have perspective. Uh, I understand how fast everything goes, so I look at time differently. Um, I have more resources so I can get the kind of help that means I don't have to choose between this and that. Right. Um, I, you know, um, I, uh, but my back be hurting, man. It's a <laughs> young man's sport. I don't care what nobody <laughs> say. Them, you know, you, you, you saw me right before we started recording. I had the boy uh, in, on my lap and it's like, you know, he's heavy and it's cool. <laughs> but at 3 a.m. he's heavy. You know, and I I used to get injured playing sports. Now I get injured just getting out this chair. <laughs> and, and so there's a way that I don't have the physical energy that I used to. I still have energy, but not the physical energy that right, I used. Right. Um, but I have more wisdom, I have more patience, um, and things like that. And my father was 50 when I was born. So yes. now I have a whole lot more appreciation <laughs> and respect. What sometimes I used to be like, you don't play catch with me. Now nah, like I, I get it. I mean. He, he played catch, just not as much as I would have liked. Well, that's right, right. But now I'm like, right. Now I'm like, oh, well, he was like 60 when we were, when I was asking. I was 10. He was like 60. 60. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to play, play catch. He's like, we watch this baseball game on TV. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we did. We on the radio. How about this? We sat on the porch and listened to baseball on the radio every day. Oh, 
and, and honestly, I, I I still get emotional thinking about it sometimes. You know, when I like I it, it those are the moments that matter. You know, I think about sitting there listening up until the end. You know, to Philly's broadcast on the porch mm-hmm. on radio, and how I want to replicate those experiences. Yeah. Just like I replicated them for my daughter. You know, I want to replicate them for the boy and say and my son the same way. Like you know, like how do we create these experiences that are rich and that are wonderful and that don't cost money? Yeah. Mark, it is always great talking with you. I, I wish we could do it more in person. I know, <laughs> so, I, know, so, so, I know. So we could so we could cut up a little more. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is Left to Black. We've been joined today by Mark Lamont Hill, professor and the Steve Charles Chair in Media Cities and Solution at Temple University. Uh, check them out on the grill on BET on Al Jazeera. Go check out Uncle Bobby's the bookstore, right? Get your latte and get your black knowledge on. Um, Thank you for joining us today, Mark. Love you, man. Love you too. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.